So recently, the uh, Home Secretary of the United Kingdom government was on uh, Breakfast News or something along those lines and was talking about how criminals are using end-to-end -end encryption to essentially evade detection and that this is unacceptable. Um, now, in some sense, that's very much true. It is unacceptable. Um, criminal activity is unacceptable. Um, but what they're suggesting is that we find a way to remove this encryption or we find a way of only allowing certain parties, like trusted government parties, to have access to it. So before we declare that as in insane, let's, let's look at what that means and what end-to-end -end encryption is and if that's even feasible. Let's imagine that I'm using WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or some other end-to-end -end encrypted messenger with you, right? So you have a phone here, right? Could be a phone, could be a, a computer. It's not really important. Some device, right, with a screen. This is why I'm not employed to design these things. This is you, but I'm going to call you Alice this time because we always do that. Uh, so does that make you Bob? It does. So we've got Alice and Bob here having a communication between two phones. There's going to be some communication mechanism between these two devices, right? It could be SMS or, you know, GSM phone signal, or it could be something like Wi-Fi over the internet. In all of these cases, there's usually going to be an intermediary server handling this transport. These phones aren't capable of connecting to each other on their own, apart from things like NFC, where you come really close. So there's going to be some server in here, which I'm just going to label S, which in the case of WhatsApp will be a WhatsApp server, and obviously going to be a server for whatever product you're using. Now, any time that Bob sends Alice a message, it's going to go via this server, by definition, because that's the thing that relays the messages to Alice. It knows how to communicate with Alice, you know, it knows what her phone number is, it has a list of your contacts and things, you know, this is how it works. This could be a phone provider and there's going to be, you know, phone antennas and things in this mix, but it's not important. So this message here is going to come in this way from Bob and it's going to go over to Alice like this. The issue is if we want to encrypt this channel, right, we want certain people not to be able to read it. If I'm sitting on a router somewhere on the internet here, we don't want me to go, oh, that's a nice message with your credit card details in, I'll have that. Right, so that's what we're trying to avoid here. Because that's how email works, right? You yeah. Could, you could sit there and... Absolutely, and, and people do. Encryption of channels is nothing new, right? We've seen it for a long, long time, right? These, these techniques, things like uh, public key cryptography and some of these ciphers have been around for many years. So how do we do this? Well, there's really two options. The first is that Alice could negotiate some shared secret key with the server. We'll call that key KAS. So, that key there could be used by Alice to talk to the server. And she could send a message encrypted by KAS to the server and say, please can you forward this message to Bob? Bob will have another key with the server, KBS, and that's what he uses to communicate. Obviously here, Alice doesn't know what KBS is and Bob doesn't know what KAS is. The server decrypts a message using KAS that it knows and then re-encrypts it with KBS and forwards it to Bob. Now this is not end-to-end -end encryption because obviously it's been decrypted halfway through. In some sense, that's a good thing. Right? If I'm a terrorist or a criminal and I send a message, this server could perform some kind of rudimentary checks to make sure I wasn't doing anything untoward. But for obvious reasons, a lot of people don't like this idea. What end-to-end -end encryption does is replace these two keys with a key that only Alice and Bob know. The idea being that this server is quite happy to relay the packets back and forth, but it doesn't have any idea what's in them. And this works out very well for this server as well, because when someone says, can you give us this data, they can reasonably say no. Not because we don't want to, but because we actually can't. The process we use for this is something called a key exchange. The obvious problem here is that at some point, Alice and the server have got to share a key without an encrypted channel. When she first ever connects, they haven't got this key yet, right? And so how do we get the key? There's a, there's a sort of chicken and egg problem. The solution was proposed by Diffie and Hellman, which is the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, right? We're not going to go into the details of the mathematics of Diffie-Hellman in this video, but I'll simply say that Alice and Bob both have public and private components of this key. They share the public ones, and then they use the private ones in secret to create a shared key that no one else can know. That's essentially how it works. So it is a way of, even via the server, producing a shared key, K, A, B, that no one else knows. So now, they have this shared communication channel. So when you first connect, you will send some identifiers to the server. You will establish a public and private key pair. And then from then on, anytime you want to connect to anyone new, you will generate one of these keys. It's called ephemeral, which means that basically you generate one almost every message, if not every message for some of these apps. The important thing is that the server, although they relayed these messages, is not involved in this key exchange process and can't inject itself in the middle, which means that it doesn't know what KAB is and it can't decrypt the message physically. 
When a minister or someone in the media says, what we really want to do is allow some kind of entry for government into this system, you can quite reasonably say that isn't possible because you'd have to inject something in the middle of this key exchange which would completely undo it. So let's think about the different ways we could do it and discuss whether they're practical. Okay, so the first one is we could go back to this system here. So we could have Alice talking to the server in a secure way using a key exchange. We could have Bob talking to the server in a secure way to a key exchange. And the advantage would be that if, let's say, a judge ordered a warrant on some of this data, the company would have it on their servers, probably, decrypted, and they could send it off. In some sense, I don't absolutely object to that because I don't really have anything to hide. Right? That's the obvious argument. But the problem is that if this server ever gets hacked, everyone's messages and emails and pictures get dumped out onto the internet. Right? We've seen that happen lots of times. We can't know for sure that this is secure. Right? So in, in some sense, what we're doing is introducing a very big point of failure that could be catastrophic, simply so that the very few people that do things illegally, could, we could serve a warrant on those people. Another alternative that gets sort of suggested is this kind of backdoor. Now, in some sense, this is a backdoor already, this double key mechanism. But when we talk about a backdoor, what we're really talking about is some mathematical property of this key exchange that no one else knows about that means that we could actually decrypt the messages, is the idea. Again, this is a huge problem. It's a problem because if someone else, a criminal, finds out this flaw, then again, all our photos are dumped out onto the internet. And it seemed unlikely to me that the majority of people who found this flaw would publicise it straight away, right? They would quite happily sit on it and see what interesting things they could find out. That's, a kind, of, that's kind of worrying. Um, so again, I have some concerns about that approach. As long as we don't have a back door, then there's no way for them to get in there, is there? Uh, well, so yes and no, right? The issue is that the messages have to be decrypted somewhere because they have to be presented onto your screen. Right? So Alice receives this message, her mobile app receives the message, using KAB it decrypts it, and then it's on the screen. Right? At this point, someone just steals the phone, runs off and reads the messages, yeah. or bugs the phone um, and reads the messages routinely, has them forwarded on. In this day and age of quite secure end-to-end -end encryption, the much more likely target of attack is not the encryption itself, it's just the endpoints. So I've got your phone here, right, which you've kindly left the pin code off for me. And I can just scroll through your messages and read them all, right? They're not encrypted because that encryption has been removed once it got to this endpoint. So it's basically automatically decrypted them? Well, yes. To have a good user experience, it's got to essentially hide all that encryption away and it presents you with a nice set of, un of readable messages. So in some sense, then your security relies on your pin code and the operating system running on your phone or your laptop device. Um, and if those are vulnerable, then, you know, it really be it, the end-to-end -end encryption is completely circumvented. This is directly adding content to my normal vision. The problem is the area that it has to add this content is really very narrow. I think it's the equivalent of a...